everybody. Don't get shy. Edward, I know you have it in you. Now, what a way to start off. However, we're not going to start yet. We have a cool little video that we want to share with all of you. Um, Hannah?
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Hannah. Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Miguel Bustos, and I am the director for the Center for Social Justice here at Glide, and we're so happy that you're here. Um, you all are in for a treat. We have a group of folks that have dedicated their entire lives for the community, and they're going to share some wisdom with us. But before we get to the panel and the stories and wisdom, uh, we do what we always do is we do a land acknowledgement. And I would like to introduce Guled Musse, who just joined the Center for jo Social Justice. And uh, he is now our community engagement manager, and he will be leading our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you all for attending this beautiful event. Um, so before we get started, I would like to uh, start by honoring this indigenous land. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rametush Ohlone, who are in the who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their tradition, the Rametush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respect by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Guled. Now, it is my pleasure and honor to not only introduce, but to know these speakers that we have before us these leaders, these elders and prophets that have really lifted up our communities for decades. So first I'd like to start with someone I know very well. Uh, her name is Alicia Busto Sandoval. Uh, yes, she is related. Uh, she is my cousin. Uh, her mother and my father were brother and sister. So that makes us primos hermanos, um, which means we're like siblings in, in the Latino culture. And uh, she is born and raised here in the Mission District. She currently works for Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco, but she has worked for over 25 years to lift up our community. One of the things that I'm very proud of is she spent seven years working for the United Farm Workers, working alongside Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, uh, really fighting for the rights of those who pick the fruits, uh, that labor so hard for all of us to be able to have what we have in front of our plates. Uh, she is a board member of Calle 24 uh, here in San Francisco. She lives in the East Bay, and she's probably one of the folks in our family that really made it to the top because of the work she does. So, Alicia, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is, is someone who all of you should know. If you don't know her, get to know her. It's Olga Talamante. Uh, they just did a documentary about her, so I would... I'm putting a little shameless plug for you, Olga, because I think it's a story that needs to be told and that people need to know about it and maybe if you're comfortable sharing with us. But she is the executive director emeritus of the Chicana Latina Foundation, which is an organization that does incredible work of lifting the lives of Latina women, especially those that first generation that are going to school, to college. And that organization gives so much hope to women and it's amazing. And I would encourage all of you to check out what the Latina Chicana Foundation does. She has an honorary doctorate degree from the San Francisco, the University of San Francisco, as well as she received her bachelor's from the UC of Santa, University of California, Santa Cruz. She is a leader in the LGBT community, in the Chicana X community, in the Latin American solidarity community, in other progressive political movements. She is a force to be reckoned with. And so we're very glad and honored to have Olga here with us today. The next person I've known my, almost my entire life, his name is Roberto Her Yamir Hernandez, who is the mayor of the mission. Now I gotta tell you, nothing happens in the mission without Roberto knowing about it and influencing it for always a positive way. He is the father of seven, grandfather of 16 and the great grandfather of one. He is president of the San Francisco Lowriders Council, co-founder of Calle 24 Latino Cultural District, Our Mission No Eviction, founded Roadmap to Peace, 
is the, um, the producer of Carnival San Francisco that happens every year. And most recently, most recently, he founded the San Francisco Mission Food Hub that feeds thousands upon thousands of people here in the mission. And it started during the pandemic. So when people were losing their jobs, not being able to work, and were trying to find ways to find food, Roberto created a team and made it happen. And as a result, I think it's 7,000 or 10,000 people a week are being fed by Roberto and the efforts of those at the Mission Food Hub. So ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's shake our hands and give them a round of applause and welcome them to our, our panel. Um, what you have in front of you, guests, can't find this anywhere else. You have wisdom, you have love, you have passion, all the things that GLIDE stands for. So on behalf of GLIDE, thank you for being here. So we have a couple of questions we're gonna start and uh, we're gonna do a popcorn style. Um, this is a question that I thought would be kind of interesting because all three of you are so steep into our culture, into our cultura. And if someone came to you and told you, we're gonna take away your culture, you will not have it anymore. What would you say and how would you feel about that? Let's start with Roberto. I know he has plenty to say on this one. Well, that already happened to me. <laughs> when I was a little boy, you know, um, I mean, my mom was six months pregnant when she came here. And of course, you know, I learned Spanish first. And when I went to Bryant School, which we literally lived right across the street from, um, I was forbidden to speak Spanish, uh, even though that's the, my first language bo being uh, born and raised here at the age of five. And in those days, there was no bilingual education. Um, and so I got in trouble in kindergarten and at one point got sent to, to, to the principal's office. And at that time, you either were black or you were white. My birth certificate says I'm white. So I already grew up in a time where we were stripped of our language, we were stripped of our culture, and we didn't learn anything in schools. And it wasn't until I got much older, you know, that, that I, I learned who I was. And having that stripped away from me was very frustrating. And that frustration turned into anger. And at some point, it turned into hate. And so I had to unlearn uh, that hate against white people. I had to learn uh, that that was racism and that was discrimination. And But during that childhood period of my life, it really uh, cost me a lot of pain. Um, and thanks to my mind, cultural elder healers, I was able to learn who I was and able to heal. Wow. I appreciate you sharing that, um, Roberto, a lot, because that's, that's, that's such a, um, a, a common story, right, that, that, that happens to so many children. And it in some ways continues to happen. Um, and, and I'll say a little bit about you know, my, my own personal experience, but I wanted to just say that that they, you know, just historically the colonizers have tried to strip, you know, the colonized peoples of the cultures, right? I mean, uh, uh, the Spaniards built the temples, you know, their own churches on top of the temples, right? And 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 you know, the the African enslaved people, um, you know, their culture was developed, they would get, they were taken away. The children, you know, the Native American um, indigenous kids that were taken away uh, to be raised as, as as white people, right? To to take their their their, their clothing, their their their, their language, uh, their culture away. Um, and so I think the efforts have been there. So I think when you when you ask that question, um, Miguel and, and Roberto, of course, has you know, it has lived it already. Um, I think that those efforts 
have been there and they continue to be to be there and and yet culture exists right and persists and look look what Alberto went on to do to be you know heading the carnaval one of our most amazing cultural you know um institutional events um that celebrates the culture um and you know i, I had a different experience just to talk from the personal perspective because i I was born in Mexico and I lived there till I was 11 years old. So I went up to the fifth grade in Mexico. And then we came, we came here, came to Gilroy to work in the fields and worked as farm workers for many years. And, and it was, it, it, to me, it was, it was sort of like one of those like, uh, oh, wait a minute, like, why are we valued here? <laughs> you know, like, why, are, why is our culture not known? And, and why, um, and, and you know, and I spoke Spanish, and on, you know, and I had to learn English, and in, in my whole family, and so on. And at the same time, you know, if you think about like the cultural shifts that happen, you know, the, our relatives in Mexico, Salas uh, as pochos, in pocha, right? So like we're not, we were not from there anymore. And then here we were, we're you know, we're the beaners, we're the we the wetbacks. And so in terms of culture, I think what happens is then, 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 then we take. You know from what is our foundation and we form our own culture and that's what to me that is what chicken next you know chicana chicano culture that that is it, it, it includes all our our peoples you know from central america that have helped to create what it is you know um, then it, it becomes our own culture so well so you know kind of like <laughs> here's to you you know we'll create our own culture you know and uh and i think something of, of, of the cultural institutions and events here in, in San Francisco in the mission especially are a reflection of that. They're a reflection of our resistance uh, to being stripped from our cultures. Thank you, Alicia. That's very true. And it's such uh, amazing that uh, us, we share the same experience as a Latino, Latina uh, living in San Francisco in California. I have same of those uh, similar stories. Uh, when I think about culture, I think about my identity. Uh, I identify myself as Chicana, Mexicana uh, because of the roots. My parents immigrating from Mexico to San Francisco where they met in the mission district where they got married in the Mission District. Um, I remember the stories. I remember when I used to go to Mexico, when I used to go to San Nicolás de Ibarra in Jalisco, Mexico, and I would go visit my uh, my Mama Juanita, uh, my um, grandmother. I would go uh, visit her and I would see, I would see people out on the street. Uh, I remember vividly uh, two girls calling me um, Bocha, telling me go back to the US. But when I'm in the U.S., I'm racial profiled. Um, I'm, 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 especially during the Prop 187, I was told go back to Mexico. Right? Uh, we're discriminated. We uh, there's a lot of racism. Going to school in the East Coast, I I I experienced so many things. I was one of two Chicanas in the university that I, I attended, um, but yet. I stood my ground. Instead of getting angry, I, I wanted to organize, right? The importance of organizing. I joined the United Farm Workers, right? To me, the United Farm Workers, it's part, it's part of who I am. It's part of my cultura, right? The language that I speak. I'm bilingual in Spanish, making sure I'm actually, I'm living each day speaking my language. I do remember when I went to high school in Wallenberg in San Francisco, being told, being in the computer lab and being told that I couldn't speak Spanish. Things happened. We encounter a, a many, many things. Um, it, it feel, some, sometimes it feels like I'm caught in two different cultures, right? And being a Mexicana, Chicana, and also living, living in the United States. But that's my home. This is what I grew up. I was born and raised in the Mission District. That is my community. Yes, it is. It's it, what's interesting. One time I was told I was walking down the street and someone said, well, you go back to where you came from. I said, well, I'm on 20, I'm from 24th and Harrison. Where are you from? Idaho? I mean, I was just like, wait a minute. What do you, what, where I, this is where I'm from. Um, I want to do something unconventional, unconventional right now that we usually don't do, but I think it's really important. Um, I want to acknowledge an elder that just showed up. Uh, someone who I've known for many, many years. Uh, her name is Gail Small. 
Uh, she is an elder from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, uh, zooming in from her reservation in Montana. Gail, thank you so much for joining us, uh, for the work you're doing to preserve culture with indigenous people all around the world. Um, and we're honored that you're here uh, to be with us and to support us. And we, we did a land acknowledgement because we have to do that. Um, but thank you for your wisdom and your support for all that Glide does. Thank you, Gail. So the next question um, is, um, so you all have gone and have gone into the professional world and how has your culture, how has your cultura helped you? Uh, giving you insight to some of you have worked in corporate, some have worked in educational environments, some have worked in community development. Um, how has your culture guided you or given you the insight in, in your work and in your professional life, we'll say for right now. Olga? Yeah, I, I actually just uh, got down a message that my mic wasn't working. Is it working right now? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you know, um, I, because of having worked um, in what were kind of corporate settings as we were trying to, uh, when I would work with En-ROADS and we were trying to um, make sure that our uh, students of color, uh, college students, had all of the, um, the tools and the skill sets to be able to maneuver their way through um, you know, corporate positions. Uh, it, it was part of the business world, um, wanting to diversify and, and recruiting uh, college students. And, and we wanted to make sure that our students were well positioned to be su successful. Um, and at the same time, to not um, lose sight of where they came from. So it was a very interesting kind of um, balance that we that we have to keep. Because we told the students, you have to learn everything there is to learn. You know, if you want to, if you're going to work in a bank, you need to learn how the bank works in accounting, you know, in marketing, and so on. Because we said, because wherever you go, um, you you will have to have a play a role of being a, a change agent, and and that was the kind of approach that we had. And at the same time. It was really important that we um, uh, really encouraged and maintained and supported the students in um, knowing where they came from uh, and, and, and what gave them strength. Um, sometimes the students would, uh, would, would kind of see like, well, you know, um, I, I'm the first one in my family to go to college and, um, you know, I grew up uh, speaking Spanish and um, it was like, how terrific, how terrific. You're the first one and you won't be the last one. How terrific that you grew up speaking Spanish. You are doubly valuable because you, and, and you also speak English. So you're, and you're going to college. And so it was a, a constant, um, you know, uh, kind of approach with the students to make sure that they were totally, um, uh, you know, strong standing in terms of who they were. And I think in terms of those of us who were the professional grouping of, um, African American, um, uh, uh, Latinx, and and also and, and we had uh, also some of our other ethnicities, um, but it was a primarily a black organization. And so we were just we just felt so um, much like in in maintaining our own culture. Then you know we do our damn own parties. Yes, we we went to the corporate happy hour and we went to the to you know what we needed to do in terms of the business and all of that. And then like we all I think do is then we have our own, we have our own music, we have our own food, we have our own um, you know, clothing, we have our own saying. And, and so, and, and that ha that, that's what sustains you because then you have to go into this other world where that is not welcome, where that is not celebrated, where that is not accepted. Some things are changing because some people are getting woke about this, you know, whole thing that it is the whole person that's coming to work, right? Um, and so I think there is consciousness around it, but I think that that's that's how that's how we did it, and and by working with each other and supporting each other, and and having that kind of unity also across cultures, you know. And I, my 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 parents were always I'll just finish with this. They're always really good about like. You know, being really uh, embedded in, in the culture, they were, my parents were singers. My father played the guitar. They put me in ballet folklorico all the time, so we were embedded in it. 
but they also taught us that to love your culture does not mean that you disrespect other cultures. And I think that that's, that's a cultural trait, you know, to be then able to be open and accepting of the cultures of the other cultures around us. Thank you, Olga. Alicia. Uh, yes. Uh, so it's really important when we're talking about culture, right? We're talking about ideology, about values, about, um, but one of the things that our ancestors have taught us is about connections. Well, for example, when you go to Mexico, it's normal. People come to you and say, buenos dias, good morning, right? But when you're here in the United States, it's like you hardly see people, right? So uh, having that connection is really, really important. Um, when I work for the United Farm Workers, uh, being able to have that connection and serving people, if it's providing services, if it's organizing in the, in the boycott offices, it was really important to have that connection with the, uh, with, the, not, with the farm workers, but also with the community members who were supporters of the United Farm Workers, to have that connection and to know um, what would some of our ideals. Growing up in San Francisco, I remember my, in first grade, right, um, Mr. Kerbel used to be my first grade teacher at Hawthorne Elementary School. And the number one thing that I remember about him is that he taught us. There were, there's these few words that he taught us uh, and it started from first grade. He said, si sí se puede. That really ingrained in my, in my memory. Si sí se puede, right? Same thing with Cesar Chavez had taught us. Si sí se puede, Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez both have taught us si sí se puede, right? And, and it's really important to make sure we're, we're, we're following that in our everyday lives, right? Um, I currently work with Housing Rights Committee. We work with a number of um, tenants who are, are fighting against gentrification, evictions. Um, I, I formed, I, I, I've been able to connect with some of the Spanish speaking tenants um, uh, who may be vulnerable, uh, especially during the time of COVID. So we've been able to connect with tenants. Connections are really, really important when it comes to culture, but also values. What are some of our values? One of our values is being able to help other people, right? Being able to help and give back to my community where I'm from. Being able to organize and connect with people in my own community. So being able to connection, values, sacrifice, things that we were instilled when we were child. And as an adult, I've been trying to give back to my community. I've been trying to help other people and um, also implementing the tools so other people can then organize themselves and create a change in their community. Thank you, Alicia. Roberto. So I grew up in a time here in the Mission District where there was just about every kind of Latino. And there's a difference between a Puerto Rican and a Nicaraguense and a Brazilian and uh, um, uh, uh, Hondureño. And a lot of people don't know that, you know? Um, and growing up, we were all like called Mexicans. You know? <laughs> and, and the beautiful part about growing up here in the mission was that they, it, was, it was considered one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Francisco. And a lot of people didn't wanna live here or did not want to even come here, um, which is a different story today, right? And I really never felt that we were poor. I really felt like I was rich because I got to interact with all these different Latinos from different parts of Latin America. And also there was a lot of Filipinos that lived here in the mission, Samoans and African-Americans and Irish and Italians. And so I grew up in, in, in this melting pot as a little boy, right? And I remember like loving on Saturdays watch Soul Train and 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 learning all the all those dances. And my mother would tell me, "Vos no sos negro, aprende a bailar el palo de mayo," and you know, and 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 uh, and so I I I really didn't have an I cultural identity, you know, I imitated other cultures growing up and it was my abuelito who was like the 
the anchor in terms of our culture and because he played guitar and he with his guitars he would sing songs that told stories and so that's how I learned a lot about our culture and that and so I always was curious and had conversations with him and finally one day he said mijo you need to leave here and go to where we're from to learn what your culture is and so I did I got up one day and I went started in the Yucatan I've, I've gone through the whole Yucatan I've I've traveled through Guatemala through Belize as far as Nicaragua because on his side were Mayans people didn't know who Mayans were at the time and I, I it's funny because you know I, I uh, um, I learned from a lot of my elders through what's considered Mundo Maya, right? And I learned to respect Mother Earth because Mother Earth produces and gives us frutas y vegetables and all these blessings. I learned about Father Sky. I learned about El Dios del Sol, El Dios de la Luna, and all these beautiful traditions of the level of respect that we have for uh mother earth and, and 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 all our natural elements you know and through ceremonia and then mayans we have 31 different dialects we don't even speak spanish which a lot of people don't know right and so when you look at the 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 richness of our culture you know uh just within the mayan community right for me, that's really enriched me and really opened up my eyes and it fed my heart, my soul and my spirit. And I finally became one within me and proud to be who I am and, and to be able to share that and teach others. Um, and that's, you know, going to, 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 to Mexico. I, I could relate to the stories about you know, being told, you know, that I was a pocho there and, and go back here when I didn't belong here. And so I didn't belong there and I didn't belong here, you know, and it's like that, that until I really found out who I was and connected with my roots and people, right, that, that I felt comfortable being there and then being comfortable here and being able to express and educate people who I am, right? And I think that that's one of the, the most beautiful thing about learning about culture. And, and then through Carnaval, I've been able to, oh my God, you know, learn about the Afro-Cubano and, you know, uh, Panamanians and the Afro-Brazilians and our connection to Mother Africa, you know, and, and, the, and the different tribes within the indigenous communities throughout all of the Americas. You know, and it's something that we we were we were stripped of learning in school. Wow, Roberto, that's that's so true. And and um, the, it, what's incredible about what you just said is that the, you, you highlight the fact that within the Latino community, there is so much color. Right. We have Afro Latinos. We have Latinos that are Asian from Asian descent. Right. And indigenous right and it's like i was with a friend of mine mary and she her family is puerto rico and she people assume she's only african-american and one day we were at a restaurant she's busted out speaking spanish and someone looked over like oh my god but it's it's beautiful that there's so many parts of our community that are that represent the incredible rainbow of the creator's creation right and i i i I, I love that. I love that about who we are as a people and that, um, you know, there's the Spanish side, but there's also the indigenous side. And, and I like the fact that you mentioned about Mother Earth. And I've always been fascinated how um, the environmental community or the environmental movement in some ways had been hijacked um, by mainly Caucasians because it's more than recycling and composting. It's about our understanding of who we are with Mother Earth and how we treat Mother Earth, how we treat one another. And I actually think the environmental movement should be led by indigenous people because it's about really truly getting to the heart 
of how we're going to protect our earth. And it's about that deep understanding. And at Glide, what's interesting is, you know, we sometimes get asked at the Center for Social Justice, um, and I, I'm so thrilled that Rita Shimon is here um, joining us because uh, she can attest to this, but we're always asked, well, can you do diversity, inclusion, and equity um, uh, trainings? For us, it's not about just checking a box. It's about getting to who we are. Diversity, equity, inclusion is not nine to five, Monday through Friday. It's about shifting our mindset and how we open our hearts and minds to everybody. So this is, I, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. Um, all three of you are social justice warriors and are prophets because you have given this world a vision on how the world should be. How has culture been either a way forward for it, a strength, in, in how you see our social justice movement as a Latino community? How do you see that, that culture play a role in all that? I'll start with Alicia. Um, culture is very important. Um, is very important in our in our community. Um, as I as I said, culture is who we are. Culture is having that connection, having that security, having uh, knowing where you where you come from, um, knowing where we were raised. And uh, oftentimes, environment can change how we feel about culture, how we feel about beliefs. Uh, knowing that. Um, you have that mentality about si se puede. You have that mentality about you need to keep going, having that possibility. When I talk to tenants, it's really important to make sure letting them know we can do it right. If we organize, if we're together, we will win. It's really important to make sure we're having that hope, that hope that if we organize in numbers, we can do it. So I really, it's really important. Um, having that connections, uh, connecting culture uh, with each cause that we're involved in. If we're involved in tenant rights and we're involved in trying to make sure um, Calle 24, expanding uh, the mission district um, uh, districts, it's really important that culture is part of it. Culture to me uh, is having a connection. Culture to me is having that historical perseverance that we need to preserve our culture. We need to preserve who, our, who we are. We need to preserve the history of our grandparents. We don't know what went through. Oftentimes, um, a lot of the oral history gets lost from our grandparents. Um, it's really important to preserve that. Uh, culture is important. Uh, we don't know what happened back then, but all we can do is move forward. All we can do is use the experiences that we've experienced so far in our lives, but also hearing hearing the old history of our parents. Um, every time I go to Mexico, um, I take that time and, and talk to my dad because my dad has all these stories. He has so many stories to tell me. So what I do every time I go to Mexico with my parents, I walk up to La Presa. I walk up to a hill where you could see the, it's like a river dam kind of thing and you could see it. So we walk every morning. I don't walk to exercise. I walk to hear the history. I walk to hear the stories of my dad because my dad heard stories from my grandparents. And then they heard stories from my great grandparents. It's so, so important to be able to preserve our culture, preserve our history, preserve the stories that we hear. So then we can make sure that our, 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 um, our sobrino, sobrinas, our nephews, uh, nieces are getting that same story. And it's continuing generation by generation. The boost of family, how many generations do we have? So many generations. So it's so, so important to be able to expand and say it out loud, right? Say it out loud. Uh, culture is so important in the work that we do, but culture is so important in, the fam in our family, in our immediate family, in our friends, in our familia, in our comunidad. So, so important. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Olga. Well, it's just great to see. Uh, uh, I love hearing Alicia just like, 
just like you're you're like on the on the on the stage organizing people, you know, right now. So uh, thank you. I love I love that the passion, um, and and that's why I can see why you're so effective. Um, you know, in in terms of the yeah the question about like how you know why is it so important in terms of our social justice um, uh, movement? Uh, there's no way we could do what we do and what we have been doing for all these decades if we didn't have the sounds, the songs, the words, the the images of of, of who we are by our artists and in 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 not only do they represent like our current realities, you know, I, I, you, we all know the magnificent um, artists that we have here in, in, in the mission. And I'll just mention Esther Hernandez just because she is, I love what she does is she depicts the people, you know, La Vendedora de Flores, uh, that the little girl that she depicts that, uh, that had her little dress, is, and it's her when she was little, uh, from the, the flower sack. I remember my mom made our our clothes from those flour sacks, los, los sacos de harina, right? Uh, after making the tortillas and using that. And so I think, our, so to have those images in which we see ourselves reflected for one thing, which is our, th those are our current realities. And then to have also images and songs that speak about the imagination of the future, that speak about the vision of the future. You know, the, the murals in, in San Francisco both depict reality and struggle and then they also de depict you know the sun and the moon and the flowers and in in what makes nature and what what gives us joy and in in songs especially there's no way that we could survive you know uh both personal loss and you know and and love's loss and you know we'll cry over our tequila you know because someone left us and you know how could we survive if we didn't have the song to go with it but other than the personal stuff, the songs that have given, you know, hope and, and, and have given um, again vision about, you know, what is possible. And, you know, one, you know, just one example is the, 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 the song, Our Children Are Sacred, that, that a group of artists here in the, in, in the Bay Area came together to send us a, a, a song of, of, of love and support to the children that were um, encaged, and, and we have to remember that that many of them still remain caged, and that's why I continue to work with the Caravana for the Children. But that that song, that our children are sacred. Our it was, it's just a, it's a love song, you know, and that helps us breathe. You know, art helps us breathe, so we can take stock of where where we are, and and, and you know, uh, and 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 it comes, you know, and it, it's resistance in many ways. Playing the radio out in the fields and listening to Motown and rancheras and cumbias and then you know and and, and then back to to uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the, the Motown sounds and then we go back to the rancheras and cumbias and that's how we worked all day long and 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 that's how we were able to to make it through the day. It was the music, you know, and in other occasions. It is the visual art, and then it's it is the film, and it's the poetry, you know, and that's what gives us our strength to continue. Thank you, Olga. Roberto. De colores, de colores el arco is que viene de afuera. De colores. He's talking about songs. You know, that That's song is sang at every single rally, every single march that we have had, you know, and along with the canciones, los cantos, um, you know, we, we start off a lot of our, you know, social uh, movements with ceremonia. You know, we start off with the, the Aztec dancers, you know, who do the... Um, burning of sage and copal and and we honor mother earth and and we go you know all four directions you know and that cultural element that is part of our social movement is what gives us strength it gives us courage 
And most important, it helps to stay balanced because, you know, the, you know, Sister Alicia was talking about evictions, you know, with our mission, no eviction, you know, that's one of the things that is been uh, here in, in the mission district for the past seven years. We've had over 10,000 people who've been evicted, yet we've saved 17,000. But, you know, in, in that movement, when you see, you know, uh, uh, a space get torn down and like, like the beast on Brian you, where literally you had a developer a speculator that came in and you know tore down two thirds of a block I mean and it, it got rid you know evicted businesses and longtime residents but we stood up and we fought and we fought and we fought you know and and the copal and the ceremonias and that we did around that project and and to be able to get, you know, win, you know, um, the beast on Bryant, the monster in the mission on 16th and mission. You know, we fought that developer from building 300 luxury units, you know, and it was a story of Godzilla versus Bambi, you know, because they had the power of money and lobbyists and even, you know, um, uh, uh, lawyers, and there was just a, you know, uh, 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 a, a little army of us that took that on, you know, and so uh, Las Canciones, the Ceremonias, the Copal, the Sage, and then the Teatro Campesino that Luis Valdez started back in the days for the United Farm Workers and, 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 and with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. I remember I was a little chavalo, you know, going to the rallies in, in Deleno, California and Fresno and Watsonville and watching the teatro, you know, just like, and then here in the mission, we had our own teatros that, that were created, you know, um, that told stories. And like Sister Olga said, you know, the murals, the murals like record, you know, the history. Uh, and here in the Mission District, we have more murals in, in any other neighborhood in, in, in the United States. And so when you look at these murals, it's not just a painting of something pretty. It's deep. It, it goes as far as the a movement in Nicaragua when the Sandinistas fought against the US control Somoza dictator. You know, it, uh, we have murals uh, that tell the story of police brutality, Los Siete La Raza, you know, and, and many stories. So yeah, you know, culture plays a huge part in our so social political movement. Yes, Olga. I, I, I just wanted to, um... Uh, because you started singing the colores, uh, Roberto, um, I, I have to share this 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 story. Um, you know, I, I most of you know I spent uh, 16 months in prison in Argentina. Um, in, uh, Miguel was referring to a, a, a documentary that I was part of, but in any case, I, I those 16 months um, uh, were pretty difficult. Um, you know, uh, difficult um, conditions and so on. But one of the things that we did um, that we were allowed to do in the afternoons, um, those of us that were, you know, the political prisoners, we get together. Um, we were able to, uh, we, we would sing and, and we would write poetry. And I, I, um, I taught them uh, the colores and, and told, told them the story of, 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 of the farm workers, which I had been part of in, in, in our movement. And, and, and they were political people, so they, they, they knew about it, but they, they, they learned the song. And they learned the song. And so when I was about to be released, they were transferring me from the small uh, prison that I was in, in Azul, in, in the province of Buenos Aires. They would transfer me to uh, Buenos Aires. I didn't know where I was where I was being taken. In fact, they put me in, in a small plane and they were throwing people out of planes at that time. And so I was a little concerned about being put in that plane, but, but in any case, as they were, and they didn't let me say goodbye to the, you know, to, to my compañeras, my, my dear comrades. As I was being led out of the solitary confinement where I had been uh, two nights and they were getting me ready to, to take me to Buenos Aires, they had all been put in the, in the what's 
the mess hall. You know, I could just see some of them through the windows. And they started singing the colores. Mm. They just started singing the colores because we couldn't say goodbye. These are just my comrades for, of, of, of the, that I've been working with with the years there. And they said, they, I, I heard the song and I, they heard it. Uh, they actually got punished for it later, but that was the way that they could say goodbye to me. And that that's the way they, they could say, you know, we're, we're, we're united, we're with you, we're political people, you know, we're, we, 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 want, we want change um, and we continue to work for it. So I just, I, I have to share that with you because it is absolutely one of my, one of my dear memories that through, through that song, you know, um, that has so much history for us, it became uh, a little anthem there in the, in the prison, you know, like thousands of miles away from here. So it's the power, it's the power of culture and it's the, it's the power of the message and, and, and the power of, of um, uh, the strength that we get from the culture um, that, that we create ourselves and that our artists create for us. Yeah, you know, Olga, um, it reminds me, we have a program called Cultural Journey at Glide, and it is uh, led by a, a incredible member of our team, Misoka Fime. And one of the things she does is she talks about the old spirituals that the slaves used to sing and the hidden messages that these songs like Wade in the Water is a song that was basically letting slaves that were running know that they're after. So get in the water because the dogs couldn't smell or get your scent. Um, so it's amazing how music um, and singing um, has been able to be that political um, tool to inform other people, whether upstream or downstream or inside the mess hall or getting on a plane because it lets people know we're not alone. So that, that's, uh, you know, there, there, there's a saying, as you all know, cultura cura, culture heals. And we'll ask this question, and then there's a couple of questions we're seeing in the chat. But, you know, and some of you have already answered it. So if you, you don't want to go into it, that's, that's fine. But um, cultura cura, what does it mean for you? And just what does it mean? Um, and maybe one other example of how it has cured you in whether you've been down um, or you have just felt hopeless, at what point has cultura cura healed you in that way? Roberto. Uh, for me personally, um, you know, I um, got poisoned with alcohol and drugs just because it was around me growing up and it was like the normal thing to do, you know, and we had, you know, as I grew up and I think some of you know that I fought to shut down and stop having the amount of liquor stores here in, in our neighborhood because they was, you know, they sell, you know, Mad Dog 2020, Thunderbird, all that cheap poison wine, you know. Um, and so when I finally got into recovery, you know, uh, and through the graces of God, I got, I'm coming up on 26 years of being sober and clean. But when I, when, when I got into recovery, part of my recovery was I joined the Latino Men's Circle. You know, and I started going to the sweat lodge, you know, and um, and so that, you know, cultural aspect of my healing, you know, wasn't just about going to AA meetings and CA meetings and NA meetings, but really going deep and and using cultura to, to cure me. And, you know, today, you know, I'm still part of that group. And, and in fact, I get young men. And, and and any any male male that needs help, and I, I bring him to to the to the Latino men's circle to help them in their healing. More recently, you know, with the with the pandemic, you know, what people don't realize is that 
there's a lot of our people who are the gardeners, dishwashers, the maids that get paid cash. And they never got, you know, any, uh, through this pandemic, unemployment benefits. And so they lost their job and they had no money. And that's why, you know, I started the Mission Food Up. And one of the first things that I did, again, learning from Cesar Chavez and the Lotus Huerta is that, you know, in organizing is it's the people who are most affected should be the ones making decisions, you know? And so I grabbed, uh, you know, uh, uh, and started organizing people that were asking for help and said, okay, we're gonna organize. We're gonna start, you know, you know this food, you know, uh, um, hub. And I said, what would you like? You know, and they started saying, well, we, we want, you know, masa, you know, and I knew masa, you know, was, you know, you can make tamales and tortillas. Oh my God, I, I've, I've eaten 17 different dishes that I never even knew were made out of masa, you know? <laughs> Um, and frijoles and arroz and carne asada and, you know, chile. And, and so the Mission Food Hub has become a, a national model uh, of a co the first culturally appropriated uh, uh, a program in the country that is giving people what they normally eat, right? And, and I'll, I'll tell you is that food is very sacred, you know, and, it, and it's given people hope through this pandemic because they've been able to, to cook. Um, and we, we started this, this, uh, uh, this cooking program where you learn how to make other, you know, like a, a Puerto Rican dish this week. And next week we learn how to make pupusas and the following week we, and so food, right? Everybody's like waiting to see what we're gonna give out this week because they know it's gonna come with the recipe. And it's also one of the things that I really encourage families to do during this pandemic is to teach your children how to cook. You know, and I say, hey, make them learn how to cry by doing an onion, you know, make it show them how to peel a potato, you know, because the, 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 we were living in a rat race before this pandemic, you know, and people just to survive. You know, a lot of times we're working two, three jobs and really didn't have time to sit home as families. Like I know a lot of us when we grew up, you know, I remember eating at the uh, dinner table every night, you know, growing up, you know, but I know that because of this rat race and the cost of living that just like has broken those traditions. And so food culturally, right, during this pandemic has really helped curar you know, and get people through through this time. That's great. Thank you, Roberto. It's so true. Anybody else like to answer or contribute on that question? If not, we have other questions. All right. Um, you know, I, I I I have. There's a question that we that someone has uh, written in the chat, and it says, "I'd love to hear advice from those trying to reconnect." with their their culture when their parents assimilated into the colonizers culture uh, they do not speak of the past my abuelita is no longer with us does the mission district have good records where i can track down the immigrant story of my parents i'm teaching my children um I'm teaching my children about our history is there any does anybody know eric do you know is there, if there's anything if not, maybe we can help, you know, Calle 24 could help start it. Yeah, one of the things uh, uh, that happens in the mission a lot is, you know, just getting your name out there, and your last name, and then start having conversations with folks right, and where your family lived. And, you know, I've done that with other folks and all of a sudden, oh, you both are the same person or yes, they lived across the street and then you start getting more information that way. So basically putting out there where your family lived, the years that they lived, and then it just starts to come together that way. That's one way, you know, that uh, you can gather that information. Acción Latina is where a lot of our archives are, you know. Uh, I'm not too sure if they have individual histories. They have a lot of our uh, history of our, our events and movements, but that's another place that you can reach out to. That's 20, uh, on 24th Street, Acción Latina, and it's Linda Wilson who keeps a lot of those archives. But, um, you can always call Calle 24. We can get you started just by putting your name out there, you know, uh, and, and seeing where it goes. 
Um, I can put the phone number on the chat for you. Great, thank you, Eric. Olga? Yeah. I, I was just gonna say, you know, it, it, it's so great that you're already starting um, this. Uh, Sylvia, I think is your name. Uh, it's already, it's, it's, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna do it. You're gonna find out. You're gonna find out about your abuelita and like I said, give the name. And I think Eric has some, um, some great um, resources. But I just wanna commend you for, for, for starting this and for wanting to teach your children um, your history. It, it's gonna happen because that's what you want to do and, and stay with it and, and, you know, and get as much of your, your, your personal family history. But meanwhile, you can teach them about, about the, the, the history of the community, the history of the movement, you know, the, the history of, 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 of what our peoples have accomplished. So you're, you're on your way. So I just want to commend you and, and, and encourage you to, to stay with it and you'll, you'll be able to do it. And the other places go to the Mission Cultural Center, you know, because they have all kinds of different, you know, from Bomba y Plena to, you know, Mariachi to Baile Folklorico to Samba. There's all kinds of different, you know, um, cultural classes, uh, music, dance and art. And that's a real good way to start connecting your children to introducing them to, you know, Latino culture and art. Yeah, actually, that's great. Those are great suggestions. Um, I actually want to ask um, our sister Gail um, from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, because I know that she's been doing a lot of work around getting uh, indigenous people to connect or understand better their culture. Uh, Gail, is there any uh, wisdom that you could provide folks uh, who, who were wanting to, maybe they haven't had a lot of it, but want to go into their roots? We'd love to hear your, your, your advice. I always think that it's good to uh, ask your ancestors for help, you know, to put prayer and requests out there in a good way and um, do it in a way that is very sincere. And you'll be surprised at what comes forth. You know, we're following and tracking now a, um, we're in a real hard time in this country and Canada with the residential schools where we're finding all of our children who were killed and abused and raped and you know just uh, left for dead all around these uh, these residential boarding schools by these churches with the support of the um, governments of Canada and the United States. And so you know we we look at how they cut our ties to our ancestors by killing our children. And so that's a real hard reality that, you know, the genocide that has been perpetrated against our people. So forgiveness is very important. And then we go about the process of healing and recovery. Many of us are in the recovery stage now of trying to identify our loved ones at these places, these, these so-called boarding schools or residential schools. But in reality, you know, they were um, internment camps. You know, like I, I gave a talk recently at the Haskell Indian University in Lawrence, Kansas. And as we drive into this university, there's a big, very large cemetery. Where else do you go into a college campus that has cemetery of students? It shocks you that this is what happened to our people. So it's not by coincidence that you don't know your culture. You don't know your family. You don't know your language. It was very intentional and it was ruthless how it was perpetrated. And so I say that, you know, there's step-by-step -step process. But first, you ask for help from your ancestors in a very sincere way, because it's gonna take you on a journey that may be very hard for you, but it's a healing journey. And, you know, we are still in that stage of recovery at this time in this country and Canada. So that's what I share with you, Brother Miguel. Thank you, Gail. And, you know, we, you have our love and support for the work you're doing in, in Indian country. 
especially around language preservation, because language is key, as you've taught me. Um, when you know your language, you know who you are. So thank you for that. Um, there was a question about, uh, it's on the topic of education. It says, I'm curious if and how the introduction of ethnic studies program at San Francisco State University, the first in the country, impacted the lives of the panelists and to hear their views on the current efforts to introduce ethnic studies programs in other parts of the country. What are your thoughts? You gotta have ethnic studies. You have to have ethnic studies. And so, so proud of San Francisco State um, for having launched the first one. And, you know, as, 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 as in Chicano Latina Foundation, we work with Latina college students from community college, undergraduate to uh, graduate students. And the impact that we can see that the ongoing efforts of ethnic studies throughout the community colleges, CSUs, and UCs, is discussed in California, not to speak of the other universities around the country. It is, it is really immeasurable. Uh, we're able to see from um, some of our most brilliant, you know, um, academic uh, professionals, um, trailblazers, feminists, you know, just revolutionary brothers that have just been transformed by having learned about their history. I mean, that's what ethnic studies is. It goes beyond that, of course, because there's political explanations of why, why we, you know, why we have certain realities, why these things happen, why was the repression, why was why was where why was the deportation happening and so on. It has economic explanations and so on and so on. But to have um, ethnic studies to be able to learn your history, to be able to then learn about your culture and your identity. It, it, and again, and the economic and political issues around it. I cannot tell you the strength and the vision that it has given so many of, of the students that, that are part of Chicana Latina Foundation. And they will tell you that that, that first class that they took, you know, in, 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 in it's like community college, CSU or UC Berkeley, or I, I was at UC Santa Cruz. We did not have ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz, but there were the beginnings of that. It, there, it, it, it was around the time of the of the third world strike in, in San Francisco. So we were just kind of like hearing all that. And then we were sitting in, 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 the, in the president's office at UC Santa Cruz to demand that we have uh, faculty and staff that, could, that, that came from our community. So it's the, so all that it, it's I think it's immeasurable. I, I really do. I think it's immeasurable the impact that it has had on this new generation of of, of academics and and professors and teachers uh, that are now you know in the classrooms that are now part of these new generations of that have the the history and and, and also have the vision um, of what. Can be what can change through education in this case and it can change through other ways but in, in education in this case because of what they went through 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 the power of ethnic studies yeah Amen. And i think i think that it's what we need to do is not only every college but every elementary school every middle school and every high school whether it be public or private, needs to teach ethnic studies. Because if you teach children and young people at an early age about other cultures, they're going to uh, learn values, they're gonna learn respect, they're gonna learn understanding, and they're gonna be able to communicate and be able to engage with all people, you know, because the way that the system set up educationally right now, it it's this these history books that we grew up with. And if you look at the history books today, you know, they're lies. They're not the truth. And it's and and it's one-sided and it doesn't really get everybody to learn to coexist because the more you learn about each other 
the more we're able to coexist. Yes. You know, I remember fighting for bilingual education and, and you know why I fought for bilingual education because I already told you my story as a child. And um, today it's interesting uh, how many other non-Latino uh, groups want their children to learn Spanish. You know, here at Buena Vista Horseman, which is one of our schools in the neighborhood, um, there's they get flooded now with applications of non-Latinos that want to have their children go into their schools because there's finally starting to see that having a second language, right? Mm -hmm is there's a value to that. You know, I've, I've been uh, blessed to have been able to travel around the world. And what I found fascinating when I first went to Europe was how in Europe, there's people that know three, four, five languages, right? right? And I, I've come back here and into and, and many board of education hearings and and other hearings when I get to ask to testify, I talk about Europe and about how they and people know three, four, five languages, right? You know, so in, in terms of ethnic studies, I really believe that it, it, it needs to start in elementary school all the way up to college. Yes. That... That's so true. Uh, it's so important. I grew up um, through the public school system um, in bilingual classes through eighth grade. At eighth grade, um, my parents thought that um, they had to pull me out and put me in English only classes. But the whole transition when a child uh, is taken uh, through ESL classes, bilingual classes, and then taken to English only classes is very hard on the child. Um, it's so important. We're very fortunate in San Francisco uh, for, having, uh, for having ethnic studies. Um, there's other counties like Bakersfield. Right now, my friend uh, who I, I work with with the United Farm Workers tells me that right now she's spearheading a campaign and trying to get ethnic studies in the schools. She's a school teacher. Uh, right now, they don't have that opportunity. Um, I'm not even saying about other states, right? I went to school out in Massachusetts, right? Where there was nothing. Uh, I remember starting a petition just to have a Latino teacher, a professor in the school. And a lot of the teachers didn't like that. Um, so we're very, we're very fortunate. I know it took a lot, a lot of work. I've been hearing some of my, my um, mentors, right? Telling me about all the work it took to just to have ethnic studies at San Francisco State. It was a fight. And um, we, we're in the year, uh, in the 21st century, right? We, we think, Things are easier, but they're not, right? Uh, we need to keep fighting. We need to, if we have to be in their faces, right? Telling them we we want to know about our culture, right? We want to know uh, about um, what it means to be a Chicana, what it means to be a Latina, right? In the US, right? Um, discussing being a Latina for two minutes in, in class is not enough, right? I, I remember growing up, I grew up, uh, as you know, I grew up in San Francisco and they never taught me about my culture. It's so, so important to be taught about your culture. See, now that, that's my cousin right there, He's preaching. Um, you know, it's interesting, there's a lot of talk about critical race theory. And um, I have to know Dr. Kim Crenshaw, one of the founders of that. And um, all she wants is just, for culture be, to be taught. And um, they folks think it's bad, but I wanna know about African culture. I wanna know more about indigenous culture. I wanna know about more Asian culture, you name it. Our lives are only more enriched when, when we know. Um, you know, I'm on the board of Hispanics and Philanthropy and we say, you don't have to be Hispanic to be hip. Right. You, anybody could be part of the organization, just like, you know, we encourage people that you don't have to be black to support Black Lives Matter. And we have to support each other. We have to be when 
you know, I, I love the fact that um, uh, Simone Padilla, uh, Afro-Latina, young woman, uh, organized the march for George Floyd. She's half Black, half Mexican. She's a high school student. 10,000 people showed up. Glide, we had a contingent there. But it's we all need to support each other because life is not a zero-sum game as we know at Glide. It's not about winners or losers, or if, if I do something to help another culture, that it's gonna be less for me. No, we're not that limited in our thinking at Glide. And I know this panelist thinks the same. Um, so it's important that we support each other. So with that in mind, um, the final question for the panelists is, so folks who are not Latino, Latinx, what can they do to be supportive now and tomorrow and the next day, what advice and wisdom can you give people who wanna support our community, but don't know how, would love to hear from you. Don't speak all at once. Well, <laughs> well I'll start, but you know, um, just to uh, elicit the, the, the wisdom and, and um, uh, perspectives of my um, colleagues here, uh, wonderful uh, leaders that we have in Roberto and Alicia. So we're so lucky to, to be in this community that that has these um, incredibly committed people. So to say that. So for one thing, I, you know, in terms of people really want to say, you know, we we want to support the Latinx community. We want to support what 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 your struggles are. And and I think is 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 quite simply it's like uh, you know it's just like learn 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 about learn of, learn about our history of struggle learn about you know our successes learn about our accomplishments um, learn about what we have um, uh, accomplished in terms of social justice um, learn about you know the the wins of of of, of our movement um, against the, the war in Vietnam uh, against the draft uh, the farm workers movement is one of our main examples, but also, you know, in, in, in terms of organizing against, you know, 187 and 209, or, you know, the propositions that they try to, to, you know, just totally demolish our, our, our gains in, in, our, in our community. But I said, if people are sincere, you know, it's don't wait for, for the community, you know, the community that you're trying to support to, to teach you everything and, and, and to, you know, um, let you know, you know, what, what you should know. It's like, it's, on, it's, it's also on your own. Learn, 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 and, 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 and also come be part of things. Uh, do not fall into the savior uh, complex. You're not gonna save us. Um, we, we will organize ourselves and we will save ourselves and we will accomplish. And if you want to support and be a good ally, then be there and listen to what we're saying about what our community needs and how we're going to carry out our organizing um, and support that. Support that, you don't have to create things for us. We are creating them ourselves, but we welcome the support. We welcome the, the allyship. You know, we, we welcome um, your joining in, in, in what we're trying to accomplish in our movement. Uh, we welcome your support and your participation um, and recognize that the leadership uh, of our movement has to come from us and from our communities. Thank you, Olga. Roberto? Yeah, so I would say one is um, close the camps. <laughs> and that's, you know, um, uh, our, 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 our challenge to you to join us in that struggle. You know, um, and some of the things that you can do is you can uh, call Nancy Pelosi, email her, Senator Dianne Feinstein, other senators and congressional representatives across the country, you know, and it's real simple. You just get an email um, and send them an email or make a phone call. Um, the second thing I think that uh, is that with the Mission Food Hub, you know, you right now we're in the middle of uh, launching our, our, our uh, Christmas toy drive. You know, um, there's 9,000 children that, you know, 
we, that we're going to provide, you know, a, a gift for Christmas. Um, the United Farm Workers, currently there's a march going on because um, uh, Gavin Newsom was really good about um, even though I, 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 well, I supported the, the no on the recall, but I'm very upset at the governor right now because for the farm workers, you know, they passed, they, they were able to get legislation to uh, be able to vote, uh, have their ballots mailed at home, just like we got our ballots to vote for uh, on the recall. But the governor just vetoed that, that bill, you know, so call the governor, tell him that just like he was able to keep his job because everybody voted by mail, that the farm workers should be able to vote on their union through, uh, uh, the, through the mail uh, and getting their ballots at, at home. Uh, another thing that you can, you can uh, help support right now is, you know, there, there's a lot of, of, of pe people that are in fear of eviction, you know, is to keep the pressure on Mayor London Breed and the members of the Board of Supervisors to here in San Francisco to make sure that nobody, nobody gets evicted. You know, we have so many people that are homeless already, you know, and and we need to keep everybody in this, these their homes. You know, I said that, you know, they said, oh, June 4th, uh, June 15th, we're going to go back to normal. No, hey, normal for who? For somebody who got a job who now uh, uh, is going to go from their house to go work at an office or at a workplace. There are thousands and thousands of people who lost their jobs, who have no money, you know, and we live in one of the most wealthiest, you know, uh, uh, cities and country in the world. And we need to be the humanitarians and, uh, you know, and take care of the people that need the most. So please help us in our uh, fight to, to stop evictions during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Alicia. Um, thank you, Olga and Roberto, for sharing uh, what you shared. Yes, it's important uh, important for you to be part of our movements, right? Uh, there's different movements happening. Um, we know uh, working for the United Farm Workers, right? We hear uh, our heroes, right? Uh, our hero, people who gave up their lives. Our Nan Freeman, who's a young Jewish woman who died for the farm workers. Uh, Najee Daifala, who's a, a young Muslim uh, brother who died for the farm workers. Um, Rufino Contreras, who is a Latino Mexicano who died for the farm workers. These are people who give up their lives for a cause, right? It's so important to be part of a cause. So I invite other people who are non uh, Latino ex to be part of our causes, uh, our struggles, uh, our, and to be part of that. Thank you, Roberto, for bringing up, uh, yeah, to make sure we're calling the governor and letting them know to do another extension, right? It's impossible for people who are still waiting on lines. They've applied for months ago for the state funding relief fund, and they haven't received a dime. They're, we don't want no more evictions, right? It's important to get the message out to the, to Gavin Newsom. We, we just elected him, right? No on uh, the recall, right? He needs to, uh, now it's time for her, for him to do action. It's so important. If you can help us making that call, making sure, uh, like Roberto said, uh, locally, uh, trying to make sure that people in the community are not being evicted. There's people who haven't been working, who can't even pay the 25% before September 30th. It's so, so important. Please support us in these different causes. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So we've had an incredible night, evening, afternoon of wisdom, of passion, and of love. I um, want to thank all the folks who made this possible. I want to thank Eric Garguello. I want to thank Hannah. I want to thank Uled. Uh, Eric has been um, sort of doing these monthly series. Uh, and now that we'll go to Guled and Eric, we'll be building up our social justice army at Glide. We ask all of you to join us at Glide. 
um, go to our website, glide.org. Um, we have a bunch of events happening. There's going to be a lot of things we may need folks to show up at Sacramento. Join us. We'll take a, a busload of folks to Sacramento. Um, now, imagine if you love this, imagine when we're going to be able to do this in person. Um, so look for the Center for Social Justice website uh, or a page at the glide.org website. Uh, we're going to be having movie nights, justice movie nights. We're doing poetry slams that are going to be happening all over the city. So there's a lot of wonderful things going on. So if you've not signed up for Glide's email list, please do it, glide.org. Finally, I, I just cannot thank these leaders that we have before us, uh, these truth tellers and truth seekers in their life. Uh, people who have dedicated themselves for justice, but who have been proud of who they are. Olga, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for all that you've done, especially with Chicanas and Latinas, giving women, saying they have a place at the table. You know, that's important. So thank you so much for that, Olga, and all the work you do for the Chicana Latina Foundation. Um, Roberto, I mean, you're our mayor. You're mayor of the mission. Keep doing what you're doing. And I mean, you have found ways to be able, when people have thought things were impossible, you have found a way for us. And so thank you so much. Alicia, you're not only my cousin, but you're also a leader and you're my leader. And I, and I love you. And I, I've always been proud of the work that you've done and the passion that you've had for our people. I think you would do and you still, you do our grandparents very proud. Um, so thank you for all you do. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. We still got another half a month for uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx Heritage Month. We hope you enjoy it. You know, the Fruitvale, if you live in the East Bay, go to the Fruitvale and shop at the local stores. If you live in San Francisco, come to the mission. Um, Take care of one another, stand up for one another, and be unconditionally loving for one another, because that's, that's the glide way. So thank you all for joining this evening. This video will be on our website. If you want to go back and get some more inspiration, we have other videos that you can take a look at. How to Stop Anti-Blackness was one of our very first ones. There's a lot of wisdom in that, so we hope you're able to do that. So thank you all very much, and have a wonderful evening.